Hello and welcome to episode two of the Piano Lessons. Uh, my name is Phil Graham, I'm Global Head of the Investment Funds Regulatory and Digital Assets team here at Harneys, joined by our crypto wizard, Mark Piano. Hello, Phil. Good to be back for episode two. Absolutely. Um, overwhelming feedback from the first episode, which was which was really exciting. Um, some really nice comments and thank you very much indeed. We also got quite a few questions uh, for the piano tuner later. Straight on to it. Piano recital. Um, Mark, we're going to recite some of the things that have happened over the last week, and then you're going to pick a particular one to jump into. We could get into the Gary Gensler announcement um, in and around the fact that Cryptocurrency fits seamlessly into the current securities laws in the US, and we do not need any further guidance whatsoever. Uh, we could get into the Binance announcing the fact that they're going to replace a whole bunch of stable coins on their platform with their own stable coin, which is an interesting, um, if not controversial, play. Um, we had the Voyager auction yesterday, which you could get into. Um, I saw that, did you see the announcement that 24% of US households now have crypto, which is interesting. And there was a commentator saying that this will play a big part in the 2024 elections. Um, cue the Trump coin any minute now. Obviously bought into uh, Skybridge. Um, so, so FBF um, sort of continuing to try his sort of saving the crypto planet uh, one step at a time. Um, I would love you to get into the Bill Murray um, conversation, but obviously you're not going to. He launched his Beer with Bill NFT collection, uh, which unfortunately then had a cyber attack and they took uh, quite a quite a high degree of funds for, for a charity. But you have decided to jump into Tornado, partly because a bunch of people wanted you to uh, from the comments we received, but also because it's we saw, I think, news from their CEO this week, Brian Armstrong, um, saying that he would fund um, the sort of legal challenge um, as part of his Coinbase presence um, to, to challenge those sanctions that have been imposed by the US Treasury Department. Would love to hear your views on that. Away you go. Sure. I think the phraseology jumping into a tornado is not the most fortunate, but I know what you mean. Um, so we've seen in the last few days the announcement that Coinbase will fund a lawsuit being brought against OFAC or the relevant departments there by several uh, parties who are alleging that OFAC has overstepped its authority by sanctioning effectively code or technology. The argument is that you can't sanction the tech because if you sanction the tech, then there's going to be all sorts of unexpected consequences. And Tornado Cash has been used for legitimate purposes. People making donations to support the war effort or particular groups in Ukraine who want to use privacy and anonymity, not just to protect the donor, but also to protect the recipient. And so there's plenty of legitimate uses for this technology. So by sanctioning the technology itself, because it allegedly has in some cases been used for illegal activity, does create an interesting set of circumstances, not least around if you have used it for legitimate purposes and now your funds are locked up in there, then why, on what basis should you be sanctioned for that or being forced to comply with the sanctions regime in respect to something you haven't done for any nefarious purpose? And as made clear in the article surrounding this news, nobody is saying that uh, bad actors who shouldn't be sanctioned or that actions should be taken against people who use the technology for nefarious purposes. But is this the right response to a particular problem? And is it even enforceable? Uh, we've seen the dusting attacks where people started to use Tornado Cash to deliberately deposit small amounts of Ether in very high profile wallets. Yeah. What's OFAC going to do about that, if anything? And from what I understand so far, OFAC has not been particularly in, uh, keen to engage with the community on this topic and, and to respond to representations or offer any kind of insight as to the basis on which they've made this decision or any openness to reverse it. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Um, it is very difficult to draw commentary either way because we this has never happened before. But I do think it's good to challenge this activity through whatever appropriate means uh, will get there and to at least understand what the reasoning is here and to understand the basis on which this will be uh, upheld by the relevant legal and regulatory bodies going forward. So very good thing to see the challenge be brought. Let's see what happens next. I mean, given, given the relative insignificance of bad actions that have happened through Tornado as compared to bad actions through using fiat currency throughout the years, and I, and I would hesitate to put a percentage on that, but it's many decimal points, um, it seems like a fascinating thing that's going to play out. 
Um, Coinbase has had obviously a variety of commentary on it on it throughout its uh, throughout its time, but I think generally the community is obviously incredibly supportive of the action they're taking here. Um, and it's nice to know there is you know plenty of firepower behind this action to see how it plays out. Um, but let's watch this space, I guess. On to the solo. Um, we have this week, we think, um, a sort of bit of exciting, um, almost momentous um, activity occurring in the uh, in the digital currency world. We have the Ethereum merge. Um, obviously, I believe second largest blockchain um, switching over to a proof of stake model, um, and and obviously all of the environmental angles there that, that often plague um, this this industry uh, potentially being addressed. Um, I saw one commentator when I was looking at this week uh, describing it as a jetliner swapping engines mid-flight, um, given the complexity involved and given how long it's taken from when the initial announcement of this um, merge sort of was was put in place to where we, you know, will hopefully be this week. Uh, Mark would love to hear your solo on it, what this means for us, why this is relevant, how it may play out, accepting that, frankly, your answer is going to be, I have no idea. Yeah, that's pretty much long and short of it. So the, the Ethereum merge has been in the works for many, many years. The idea behind the merge is that the basis on which blocks are verified and added to the network will change from proof of work, which is mining, to proof of stake, which is the operation of validators by people who stake effectively or put on the line their Ethereum tokens or their Ether. And the concept here is that it's more environmentally efficient, but there's also sufficient incentivization to ensure that the network activity remains honest and the integrity is there because if you mess around with the block validation process then potentially your wealth could be taken away it's a very significant change not least because it will also change the economics of the ether token it will make it a deflationary token because instead of new ether being created with each transaction block there is going to be a cut in the supply because now there is no need to create any more of these tokens so the argument goes that over time it becomes a deflationary token and therefore its price will increase. Not sure whether it will or won't. We've seen some very large price swings in the recent months. There is an argument in crypto that some people buy the rumor and sell the news and whether it will go beyond its current price, we don't know. But nonetheless, the basis on which this tr transition is going to happen is very significant for the operation of the network. The foundation and all the developers behind this have spent a very, very long time facing this in, running a lot of uh, testing activity and bug bounties and looking at a very wide range of parameters on the security side, on the efficiency side, and on the network continuity side to ensure this transition is as smooth as possible. Whether it will be, we don't know. It's slated to happen imminently. It is a very significant change to the operation of one of the largest blockchains in the world. So I think it's worth paying attention to. There's absolutely no point in speculating on whether the price is going to go up or go down or whether there's going to change adoption or increase or decrease transaction fees. It's of such significant consequence to the network as a whole and all of the applications and the economic activity that runs on it. We need to be aware of the wider infrastructure change and then see how that plays out at both network and individual and transaction and user level. But it's it's been in the works for a while. Glad to see it becoming finally closer to reality. And uh, let's keep an eye on it. On to the piano tuner. Um, thank you to everyone that submitted questions. Um, we actually have a, a number to pick from, so I'm gonna pick one at random, Mark, and then chuck it at you accordingly. Because we touched on DAOs um, last week. I'm sure we will touch on DAOs um, in forthcoming sessions, and maybe we get some sort of guest panelists in to give us their perspective on DAOs, because there's an awful lot of commentators in this, in this area. But one very uh, sage and sensible person asked, how does a DAO work in a dispute? So it appears to this particular person that DAOs, which have no legal personality, i.e. no form of legal wrapping, um, they all think they're decentralized, as we discussed last week, um, how much the D actually exists. But what happens if that DAO gets sued or, or litigated against? How does that play out in the real world? And does that fundamentally come back to the founders of the DAO? Over to you, Mark. Right. A few things to unpack there. So... I think when we talk about suing a DAO, a DAO doesn't exist as a legal entity in its own right. It's a group of people who are coming together and they're using technology to organize themselves and govern and make decisions and do stuff with the assets that they have. It's similar to an unincorporated association or a common law partnership. It depends on the jurisdiction and 
what exactly this DAO is meant to do and why. So I think when it comes to the question of suing a DAO, you'd have to ask who would sue the DAO and why? What standing do they have? You're talking about suing a kind of nebulous group of people who associate together from time to time and come in and out of the association. So you'd have to work out the basis of what you're suing for. Are you an aggrieved DAO member who didn't like a governance decision or you don't think that the treasury was handled particularly well? Then you'd have to work out, is there an existing constitutional or governance or bylaw system for the DAO and are you bound by that? Uh, is it even a civil claim that you're looking to make or is it more of an internal dispute? Are there mechanisms within the DAO that need to be followed first and are they binding if you decide to try and bypass them and go to a court? Uh, if you have a corporate structure or associated vehicle involved, does that have any standing? Just because there may be a corporate vehicle doesn't mean the DAO is incorporated. Again, it depends on the DAO and depends on the jurisdiction. Uh, so you'd have to look at on what basis would, would you have any standing against a corporate vehicle? Are you a counterparty to an agreement? Uh, do you have any uh, appointments or responsibilities with the foundation or the company or whatever the stru corporate structure is? Are you a director? Are you a supervisor? Are you a member? Uh, then on what basis would you then bring a claim against a group of people? Would it be the people who made the decision at the time? Would it be everyone who held membership tokens at the time? Would you have to then go through all the wallet addresses and kind of piece that together? We've seen creative ways of courts serving orders via NFTs, so you can drop stuff directly into people's wallets. Kind of slightly helps the problem of a pseudonymous counterparty, but then on what basis are you choosing that particular wallet to serve against? And you have to then go to a court and say, look, I want to serve against this particular wallet for this reason. I think it'd be interesting to see that argument be run in respect of a DAO and the basis on which you're choosing a particular set of wallets and members and not others. There's a whole bunch of complexities there, but as these organizations hold and deal with very, very large amounts of assets in some cases, and we've had calls recently where the numbers run into the tens or hundreds of millions, there will be a need to work through this. And whether it's because it's aggrieved members or counterparties who uh, agree something with the DAO and the DAO didn't deliver. When I say the DAO, I'm talking colloquially, of course, not as a legal concept. Or it could be people who um, are, are part of a DAO merger, which could be a thing in the coming months and years. And you know, minority uh, token holders, are their rights protected? Or is the constitutional structure actually followed? There's a whole range of different potential actions and against whom and why and on what basis and which jurisdiction we don't know. We're seeing some lawsuits start up in certain jurisdictions. Let's see how they unfold. But I think it is something to be aware of, whether you're a, a, someone making the claim, someone defending the claim, or someone representing or are, in some cases, because they're not that decentralized, some of them, the DAO. What does that mean? So I think you need to try and anticipate that, but also build in some protections from the, by, from the off, some bylaws, some constitutional documents, some fairly clear governance and tiered dispute resolution procedures you can use yeah. smart contracts in some cases. I don't know how enforceable that will be, but uh, it's an emerging area. And I think litigators and people in dispute resolution are going to be very busy over the coming months and years. I don't know our team in particular, you know, is looking really carefully at this and, 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 and how sort of smart contracts interact with, with the sort of governance fund, sort of fundamental constitutional documents that you and I would be, would be very used to drafting. And it, it, it's a fascinating, evolving space. It feels like we're reinventing the company all over again. Um, and and Maybe that's I'll try and take fine. a leaf out of OFAC's book and sue smart contracts. Good luck with that. Or, or we could just do that. Um, and, that, and that's where it gets really interesting. And that's where Tornado becomes ridiculous because you can extrapolate that out in, in so many different directions. Um, but, but, but ultimately, it's, it, it is cutting edge stuff. And, and, and fundamentally, if you are a founder of a DAO or someone that's intrinsically important to the operations of a DAO, getting in contact with some form of lawyer um, and having a conversation around sort of building in some protections has to be done. Right, we will wrap up there, but thank you ever so much for all, for all the questions. We'll fire another one at, at Mark next week. And in the meantime, have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Mark. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Phil.